Right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry for the uh, little bit of delay at the beginning because of technical issues. Now it's sorted out. Only problem is uh, my face is not seen to you, but uh, it does not matter much. So um, to begin with, let me thank uh, Dr. Hemant Prem Ratna. Uh, and uh, the Department of Social Sciences of KDU for inviting me for this uh, inaugural lecture on the uh, cultural linkages towards the nation ideology, uh, the certificate uh, program. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to uh, deliver the first uh, first program, uh, first uh, lesson um, today. So I'm aware that uh, those who are present here uh, is a collection of students from different academic faculties of KDU. Uh, so the, um, the specialties that you, you're following are different, but here it's a subject area that is more towards social sciences uh, and humanities, but I think the relevance of the stuff that we talk talk about in this series of lectures is very uh, relevant to anybody uh, in our country, especially for students of higher education. So the topic that I have selected uh, to deliver this lecture is the English language and cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology and beyond. Now you can see the overview of uh, this lecture. Uh, I will just, uh, to begin with, I will speak about the uh, basic concepts that will be important for you all to understand what I'm going to talk about. And then uh, I will talk to you about imperialist project and the English language. I would like to request you to begin with, don't worry much about these words. If you find some unfamiliar words, don't worry much. Whatever the words that are very crucial for you to understand what I'm delivering, I will explain. So imperialist project and the English language, and then I will discuss on post-colonial project and the English language. Then about world Englishes and new literatures. Uh, the globalization and the role of Eng the English language, what I call pan Asianism versus Eurocentricism, then commonality of cultures and ideologies. Then, uh, uh, then I will speak about Sri Lanka's contribution towards an alternative ideology and the role of the English language, after which I will conclude my presentation. Right. Introduction of the basic concepts. Now, as the title goes, the cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology, you must, some of you at least, must have already checked what these words mean. So culture, anybody who could uh, just let me know about culture. What is culture? What do you understand by the term culture? I would like to uh, hear some uh, it's some kind of interaction from the people in the audience. What, what do you understand by culture? Somebody, please. Patrala Defense University students are very forward and they are not reluctant to talk. So somebody, any idea? No idea is a foolish idea, right? What is culture? So my understanding of culture is that it comprises of traditions, beliefs, customs, but also it comprises of uh, everyday life as well. Okay, and that, thank you. Um, yeah. And culture yeah. is always and culture is always changing and it's not static. Very good. Uh, Ms. Kula Tileka, right? Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, culture is not static. Static, it is always changing and dynamic, uh, and it is uh, knowledge and values 
shared by a society or a community. Every community or every society has its own knowledge base and values which are shared amongst the members of the community or members of the society. So that is not uh, any knowledge or values specific to individuals, but it is common, commonly shared by a, a particular community. So language, religion or religions, traditions, values, dress, the, what you wear, what we wear, the tools that we use, the way of life, geographical areas, etc. All these belong to culture. So all these contributory factors make what we call culture. So when we speak about Sri Lankan culture, there, there, there we have the Sinhala language, Tamil language, and also some uh, to some extent English language and religions in terms of religions we have Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, etc. So we have our own traditions, values, the way we dress and all that. So all these are part and parcel of the culture that we belong to. So culture also is um, like um, it varies like so you can talk about uh, Sri Lankan culture, Indian culture, the geographical area wise, we can talk about culture. And then within the country itself, we can talk about, say, um, uh, Tamil culture, Sinhala culture, Islam culture. So religion wise, you can dis distinguish culture. And when it comes to organizations, uh, you can say KDU culture. Now, the KDU culture is different from uh, the uh, culture of a, a state university. Uh, so likewise, it can have various levels of understanding culture. And uh, it, what we see uh, in our day-to-day -day life is like the tip of an iceberg. Now, iceberg is huge in the sea. Uh, you can see only the tip. So what we see here, uh, in any 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 community or any culture is the tip of the iceberg. Within that, there are lots of values, uh, traditions, etc., et, et that are hidden in in all cultures. Uh, so the next term that I want you to uh, consider is the um, yes. uh, before that. Now the culture is a relative concept. Why do we call it a relative concept? It has like, for instance, our culture versus their culture, Asian culture versus European culture, Eastern culture versus Western culture, Sinhalese culture versus Tamil culture, Buddhist culture versus Islamic culture, civilian culture, you know, KDU, there can be two uh, cultures, civilian culture versus military culture. So all these are, relative concepts. They are in relation to another one, we identify a particular culture. So that is a very important concept that you have to remember. Now, ideology is also called, uh, in, in Sinhala, we call it matavade. Ideology is the next important concept that I want to, I want to discuss with you. Now, an ideology is an orientation that characterizes the thinking of a group or a nation. I will repeat, an orientation that characterizes the thinking of a group or a nation. So we can say uh, Sri Lankan ideology uh, or a Marxist ideology. It's a group of people who have similar political thinking, Marxist ideology, uh, so Buddhist ideology, Matavade in Sinhala. So now our theme is cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology. So culturally, we are different countries and uh, in Asian Asia, different countries are there. So whether we could find some ideology common for all Asian countries or Asian communities. That is the theme of your, the whole uh, project. So an ideology is also a relative concept 
like the one uh, that we discussed, like culture, ideology is also relative. There are binary oppositions. Now, this is important, binary oppositions or dichotomies or dualities. Please make a note of these three terms, which is very important for you to understand the whole lecture. Otherwise, you will not understand what I'm going to talk about. Binary oppositions, dichotomies, dualities. All these three mean the same thing. Oppositions, binary oppositions means opposite are the same thing, right? Examples, when you, when you uh, read these examples, you'll understand. Now, rich versus poor. Now, that is a binary opposition, an example for a binary opposition. Rich versus poor. White versus black. Ugly versus beautiful. One versus zero. So, these are binary oppositions or dichotomies or dualities. I think that idea is clear to you. Am I clear? Uh, students, hello. Anyone who has a mouth to talk, please. Do you follow me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you. So binary oppositions, I think it is clear to you. Dichotomies or dualities, all three terms mean the same thing. Right. So culture is a, a, a culture we talked about culture there again eastern culture western culture that is a binary opposition uh, indian culture sri lankan culture that is a binary opposition civil culture military culture that is a binary opposition similarly ideologies asian ideology versus european ideology so that is a binary opposition eastern ideology versus western ideology binary opposition marxist versus capitalist ideology that is a dichotomy democratic versus autocratic ideologies so these are binary oppositions right uh, no asian ideology can be discussed without its binary opposition of western ideology or what we call Eurocentric thinking. Eurocentric thinking is thinking uh, in terms of having Europe as the center. And uh, so Eurocentric thinking. Now, all our education is more or less Eurocentric. The modern education that we have in our country. Now we see uh, your education in the English medium. Even without the English medium, the system is such that that is European centric form of education. It is not Asian kind of education. Now we in the past we have had um, in our country also Pirivan education, what is called Pirivan education. Now in the ancient times, um, this are form of Acharya and the students. So they, they, those are those were Eastern kind of structure of education. Uh, so now what we have got is Eurocentric thinking. Uh, so now consider this dichotomy of Asian ideology versus Western ideology. Okay, right. Now, uh, so in my topic, uh, we, we say I have given the English language uh, for uh, cultural linkages towards the nation ideology. So this is the another, the other concept that is important for us to understand. So now, do we have a common Asian language? Now, in order to uh, learn about other other cultures, to establish linkages in Asia, do we have a common Asian language? Now we speak Sinhala and Tamil in Sri Lanka. Uh, in India, they speak Hindu, Hindi, uh, and Tamil, and hundreds of other languages. Uh, in Pakistan, Urdu, and other languages. So is there any common language that we can use, students? Yeah? Can we speak Hindi? Hindi? 
can you understand hindi only the films you can enjoy right yeah yes is there any particular language that is common to asian countries no, sir yeah no we can't find any common language there are uh, languages like tamil is spoken in certain parts of the world uh, asia but it's not a common language for countries so ironically we use the english language to share asian cultural linkages towards an asian ideology so this is an ironic situation we are talking about an asian culture and cultural linkages and to form an asian ideology but we are using the english language the language of the western uh, dominance uh, like uh, that has come from britain right so that is uh, I, i have said ironically so this is an ironic thing because we are talking about asian culture and our linkages our ideology but the medium which we use to talk about such linkages and ideology is a western language that is english so the question arises whether the english language is theirs or ours theirs means the people in the west ours mean the people in asia right so that is the question that is a question unanswered thus the significance of the link between the english language and cultural linkages towards an asian ideology uh, is, must be mentioned and that i i understand as a kind of a paradox paradox is a kind of a uh, situation where you can't match these two together uh, ironic situation a paradox right now the title given here is the imperialist project and the english language imperialist project and the english language imperialism now this word you need to understand what does imperialism mean anybody please imperialism anybody who knows it yeah yes imperial any guesses please guessing is a essential thing uh for learning imperialist i, uh, I can see you. yeah sir it is when a uh, 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 colonizing country spreads power through the to, to the colonized nation okay only uh, ms kulatilaka is talking and this is uh, dr himanta ms kulatilaka uh, kasun and myself others very silent <laughs> i would like you to please speak up anyway thank you uh, ms kulatilaka what is your first name dear the amandi amandi okay amandi thank you uh, yes now imperialism is the uh, uh, western cultures dominating uh, by by capturing power in countries like ours they, they are imperialists the colonialism and imperialism both are almost the same colonial masters we call them colonial masters imperialists they build their imperial or or, or the um adhirajya uh, by capturing other countries right so imperialist project and the english language uh, so that is a project that was a project uh the western countries like in uh, britain and france they captured countries in asia and africa and all other parts of the world now the origin of the english language now i will briefly talk about the origin of the english language that is useful uh now this is the west germanic language brought into the britain by germanic invaders now like the way the britain britain uh, invaded us britain was invaded sometimes ago by german germanic invaders from german west german so now this language was broke to them by them by the invaders now this belongs to this is very important in the european language family now languages have been grouped into families now uh, i think uh, it is an interesting information for most of you that this belongs to what is called indo-european language family that means now 
Indo-European, Asian and European, there had been a relationship through language, not recently, not uh, not during the time of uh, imperialist project, but before that, there had been an Indo-European language family. So we are related to the Vedic Indo-Aryan family of languages. Now uh, you can note some of these things. Those who are interested, maybe you can discover later some of these things if you are interested. Um, even if you are doing medicine, engineering, or whatever, it doesn't matter. These are interesting stuff for us to know. Vedic Indo-Aryan family of language, Indo-Aryan family, Aryan. So English, although we call it Western, it belongs to Vedic Indo-Aryan language family. So we are distinctly related uh, a, a thousands of years ago. So these languages descended from a hypothetical proto-language. Proto-language means first language or original language. Uh, uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, there had been one particular language, uh, and from that, all the other languages have been derived. That, that has been identified by researchers. Now, there is what is called Indo-European studies. You can make a note of it and search later on. There is what is called Indo-European studies. This is a field of linguistics. Linguistics is a scientific study of languages, an interdisciplinary field of study on Indo-European languages, both current and extinct. Those are languages that are there right now, and also the languages that have died down. They are now extinct. They are no more in usage. This proto-language and things are not in use now. Uh, certain languages, they, 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 they originate and they exist for some time and they die down. Certain new languages emerge. So that is again a dynamic process, language business, right? So these are really interesting areas for you all to study other than the stuff that you are studying in your subject areas. Next slide, please. Kasun. Kasun. Uh, sir, uh, body signal is that you know, sir? All right, okay. Right, now, thank you, Kason. So you can see in this one, this I just borrowed from the uh, internet. Now you can see the Indo-European family of languages. So you can see 3,500 to 3,000 before Christ. Now we are in the 2000, uh, uh, 23, right? Add that to another 3,500. So about 5,000 years ago, there had been this initial language, uh, Indo-European language family. Uh, so now you see this with the green line, the green line, you can see the Germanic languages that Germanic tribes, I told that they captured Britain. So follow this green line. Uh, that shows East Germanic and then West Germanic, and from West Germanic to Low German, and then down to Anglo Saxon or Old English. That is um, 1300 Anno Domini, that is after Christ, 1300 years after Christ, and then Middle English, and then, then this English, Old English, Anglo Saxon that came from the German. West German, and it changed into Middle English, and then it developed into modern English in 1700, 1900 AD, that, during that period. So on the same line, on the first line, you can go to the extreme left, where you can see the Indian languages. You can see Sanskrit, Middle Indian, and then you can see Hindustani, Bengali, and other modern languages. Now, Sinhala also belongs to this category. Bengali is very close language for Sinhala. So you can see the Sinhala languages, Hindustani, these languages are much older than the English language. If you just follow that line, you can see 800 to 1200 AD. So this has developed these languages, Indian, Sanskrit, and all these languages, Bengali, etc., Hindustani, Sinhala, etc., have developed uh, earlier than 
the modern English language. Anyways, what I want to point out is there is a link, there is a relationship, and we are descending from the same Indo-European language family. Okay, next slide, please. Right. So I'm still on imperialist project and the English language. Now, imperialist project, whose project is this? Is it our project? Whose project, project do you think? There are 85 people uh, uh, in this discussion, so I would like somebody to please tell me. Whose project is this? The West. Yeah, West. Uh, yeah, West. Yes, uh, West dominated by Britain, right? The Brit British people uh, went and captured uh, countries all over the world, especially in Asia and Africa. And uh, certain parts of Africa were captured by the French. And so, that, so French, French imperialism and the British imperialism are the two dominant projects those days. So under this, expansion of the English language took place. So in, in African, some African countries, French language is dominant, but uh, the English language was more um, sort of, they expanded more because they went and captured countries in all parts of the world. So. Now, there are two diasporas. I think most of you know the term diaspora because you have heard the word Tamil diaspora. Uh, diaspora is like a, a, a large scale settlement of a certain community of a, a, a language community uh, from one country to another, moving to another country and settling down there. That is called diaspora. Now, after this um, 1983 riots in Sri Lanka, a lot of Tamil people went and settled down in uh, the Western countries uh, and America, Canada, Australia, and all sort of advanced countries. So they are called the Tamil diaspora. So that is the recent diaspora that you know. But during the colonial period, imperialist project, uh, there were uh, three, sorry, two diasporas. The first diaspora, that is European expansion through trade and explorations. Now, those days, Ibn Battuta and all these people, they got into a ship uh, and they started moving uh, in the sea and they went in search of uh, uh, explorations. They explored the world. And uh, once they explored the world, they found countries and they started trade and business with other countries. So. This is large scale migrations, right? So from the Britain, they went and uh, settled down in America in the 17th century, Australia in the 18th century. Who are the people in Australia? Anybody? Now in Australia, uh, actually, Aborigines were there. They were native Australians, but the English people, what they did was to dump their, uh, you now they were having too many people in their prisons. What they did was to put them in ships and send them to Australia. So all these settlers, they are called down under. So uh, originally, English people in Australia are prisoners uh, from England. So that happened in the 18th century. Uh, and then in New Zealand in 19th century, South Africa in 19th century, and then Canada and West Indies, all these countries, large number of uh, British people went and settled down. And that is called the first diaspora. So those people captured those countries either fully or partially. And their first language is English and they are native speakers of English. So the language that descends there from them from that time is the native first language variety of English. Then the second diaspora. Second diaspora 
is a is a, a result of colonization or imperialist project right so uh, that is in the second half of the 18th century they uh, went and captured countries like in south asia india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka bhutan etc and some east african countries so in these countries now the english language that remains are second language varieties you call them english as a second language we learn english as a second language because we have our first languages uh, either uh, sinhala or tamil uh, in india there are hundreds of languages hindu hindustani is the dominant language but most people in india also know english as a second language right um so this is a continuation of the same topic imperialist project so the british influence in southeast asia and south pacific uh, also expanded the english language that is late in the late 18th century in southeast asian countries like singapore malaysia hong kong papua new guinea so this is not they didn't go and uh, colonize them but they had their own influence and the english language was spread to those countries as well and then americans they had their own influence on southeast asia especially in philippine uh, so that is that's what is called philippine english and that came a little late but spread fast in uh, american english so then uh, english language also spread to neighboring countries like taiwan japan korea the east asian countries so basically uh, through this uh, expansion uh, imperialist project and through the expansion of uh, their of uh, their influence uh, they have had their footprint in all asian countries almost all asian countries either as former colonies or as countries that they have influenced on right so uh english language in post colonial asia now uh, post colonial asia what is post colonial asia colonial colonial asia and post colonial asia when did we become uh, a colony of the britain and when did we get independence from them at least that you must know yeah when did we get independence from british <laughs> we asked this question at the interviews when you are 1948 <laughs> thank you 1948 what is the date api nidhas la vich din api danne api tam nidhas na ne ne uh both of february sir okay thank you 4th of february uh, 1948 we got independence from the british so now english language in post colonial asia now we got it in 1948 and then uh, followed by that india got it in 1949 that way all these countries got freedom from um, britain and now post colonial means after the colonial period Mm. so we have got freedom and then the situation of the english language so still the language of the rulers that became english became the language of the rulers although we got independence um the rulers used the english language that is queen's language you call them uh, so um they were uh, sri lankans but truly not sri lankans within themselves so they were a kind of a hybrid community uh english inside then single outside kind of so english language became the language for governance and administration all administration was done in english governance was done in english parliament was run in english uh, and judiciary uh, and education especially higher education uh, all this dominated by the english language a judiciary means the uh, the law students might know still you are depending on the english language and the roman uh, dutch law and um, that law legal system also have come from them 
So language is for judiciary was English and language for upper classes. Now there is this class distinction, upper class, middle class, lower class, and English was limited for the upper class people, social class, right? Samaji Panti. So only the uh, dominant class of people knew the English language, they learned in English and all the others learned in native languages in the periphery. So although we got independence, the, the status of the language was there and that was a dominant thing and they were able to control us from there, from there in, in Britain. So now the continuation of dichotomies. Can you remember the term dichotomy now? Give me another term for dichotomy. I gave three terms for uh, this thing. Binary oppositions? Binary oppositions. Yeah, dualities, binary oppositions. Thank you. And English educated upper class of natives versus vernacular educated underdogs. Vernacular means Deshi Basha, Singhala and Tamil. Vernacular educated underdogs. Underdogs are Alleha Puravesio, Supirikati, underdogs. So, English educated upper class of natives. Natives means Sri Lankan people, uh, but they were like in opposition with the vernacular educated underdogs. Powerful English language versus powerless native languages. That is another dichotomy, binary opposition. Superior English language versus inferior native languages. Native language is not inferior, but in this comparison, uh, that was more powerful. English was more powerful, and our languages were like sidelined as second kind of uh, second class or third class languages. Next. So this is a part of the imperialist project, right? So even though they left physically, they were having control over us uh, in a different way through education, etc. Their system was running. Uh, so this is a part of the next slide. I don't know how it has come over here. All right, yeah, okay. So imperialist project continues, right? Now east-west dichotomy. Now east-west dichotomy East versus West, right? That is the validating ground for imperialism and Western hegemony. Now, imperialism is Adirajyavadya, Adirajya Pavatma, Western hegemony. What is a hegemony? Anybody who understands the term hegemony? Hegemony is dominance. You dominate others. You are the more powerful one, hegemony. You have the control. You get things done the way you want. So Western hegemony continued even after independence, right? So for that, what is the validating ground? Validate, make a validate ground, make a shakti, then mukhenda, mename east-west dichotomy. This comparison between east and the West, that is the one that gives authority and power for them to control for Western hegemony. So look at this. Now, West and the East, see the dichotomy, see the comparison, right? West is thought to, thought to be powerful. East is thought to be powerless. West is thought to be cultured. I, 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 I emphasize on thought to be, right? It is not the reality, but they showed to us that they were more cultured and we were uncultured. The sad side of it is people in our countries believed that we are less, we are powerless and we, we were uncultured or less cultured. Uh, the truth is, of course, we were more cultured than them because from that language itself, you could see our languages were thousands and thousands of years older than the English language. But still, they through, through their power, they convinced that they are more cultured and we are uncultured. That is how they created the myth and the story, the West, right? And then civilized. Now, in fact, 
one of the reasons that that they showed to the world that uh, ca coming and capturing countries like ours is uh, fair, their project was to civilize these, these uncivilized people. In, if you read their texts, uh, history books, you can see they, are, uh, they say their idea is to civilize these, these uncivilized people in the uh, East and educated West and uneducated East, sophisticated West and unsophisticated East, normal and familiar West and exotic, exotic and strange East. They showed the Asians, right? Exotic and strange. Superior culture in the West and inferior cultures in the East. That is what they showed. But uh, our cultures were much older than their cultures and they were more better established uh, thousands of years ago. But that was all hidden. So rich. West and the East, poor East. So this is the dichotomy that gave the validating ground for continuing imperialist project and the Western hegemony, Western power. So now post-colonial project and the English language uh, continuing. So by the mid 20th century, South Asian countries, including Sri Lanka, gained independence from the British Empire, mid 20th century. Yet the cultural hegemony or the dominance continues through the institutions created during the colonial era. So they had established their system here uh, in our countries. And then the system runs things. Even to date, we have problems because of the systems that they have inherited to us. So all this English education, democratic governance. Now, before that, we had kings ruling. They, they called it autocratic system, and that is not good. And democratic system is the best. And the people ruling, uh, people uh, go governing themselves, kind of democratic, very nice, beautiful words legal system and uh, they have a nice legal system, uh, administrative system, the uh, English customs and traditions adopted by the ruling elite. Ruling elite means the elite means the high class people uh, in, in the government, right? Uh, so all uh, English speaking, um, uh, Western dressed kind of people, right? So that system, continued even after independence. Now, this is a post-colonial project, right? So the project continues. Only the form is different. Their dominance continues. So this supports the continuation of the Western hegemony in Asia. So all these systems support the continuation of the Western hegemony, Western power, uh, Western control, Western dominance. It continues in Asia. So natives believe in their inferiority compared to the West. Natives, Sinhala, Tamil, etc., they themselves believe in their inferiority. Superior, we are inferior. So we believe that compared to the West. So the English language remained as Kaduha. This is post-colonial project, right? After independence. In the English language remained as Kadua. If you ask your parents and parents' parents, sometimes they would say, then Nankia Namangitani. English language was called Kadua. Why is it Kadua? Why do you call it Kadua? Ekali appear school and call him Kenya and Kadua Dan. English in Katano in Kadua Dan. Kadu Kiani Kapanda Pachikan Nikakni, Vepan Nikakni. So if you speak to somebody who does not know English, and uh, you are humiliated. It, 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 it's uh, uh, you become ashamed, uh, and you can't wear trousers and travel in buses and trains if you don't know English, because somebody will speak to you in English if you wear trousers. Hmm? Those days, this is uh, in the 60s, 70s, 1960s, 1970s. You know the time we were schooling. That was the situation. Uh, you can't wear loans if you don't know English. So this kadua, kadua is a symbol of oppression, oppress uh, in the disoriented psyche of the natives. Uh, 
native psyche, mentality were disoriented. We were like rootless. We didn't know who we were. Mm? So in that situation, until perhaps the beginning of the 21st century, uh, we believed that the English language is a superior language and we were afraid really uh, of this language. So meanwhile, Asian cultures that in effect were much older remained on stone inscriptions and ola leaf books. This is very important. Asian cultures that in effect were much older and much more important remained on stone inscriptions are gal wala kotapua and ola leaf books tal kola wala liapu pus manada pus kola put eva mata ape parana danum old our old knowledge were written there and some of them were stolen by the british and uh, some of them are kept in their museums even to date so the uh, the oldest book uh, a history book mahavansa uh, it belongs to us sri lankans so they were like nowhere when our people wrote such books but they remained there and people uh, did not know much importance of those things right so the english language in post colonial asia uh, uh, English was considered as Kadua, the symbol of oppression. English developed into... Now, uh, after some times in the 21st century, English began to develop into regional varieties, what are called world Englishes of their own identities. Now, this is a new trend. Mm -hmm. So we began to see the development of different varieties of English called Sri Lankan English, Indian English, African English, etc. If anybody of you have seen Mind Your Language, uh, the program uh, in which they laugh at uh, people, uh, India, especially Indian and Asian people talk, trying to talk English and the mistakes that they make. Now, this, uh, this is a very racist film that they had produced, uh, television series. Mind your language. We also laughed at ourselves by listening to them, watching them. I don't know whether you have seen this Mind Your Language uh, program. It was very popular those days at the beginning of television in Sri Lanka. Uh, so we were laughing in, in a way at ourselves because our mistakes. Now there's this Indian guy uh, pronouncing our a frogzer kind of language, right? Uh, uh, um, so um, that uh, that pronunciation, they, they were making a mockery of it. So, but the Sri Lankan English developed, Indian English developed, and African English developed uh, gradually as different varieties. Now, these languages were used as language of the upper, uh, before that, it was used as the language of the upper class elite as a tool of education uh, before that before these languages becoming uh, local kind of uh, standard languages. Now, now that has become a part of our cultures. Now, now English is used in our countries as a lingua franca or the intra language or the link language within different nationalities. Now to speak, now, uh, Tamil and Sinhala people, if you want to communicate, English works as an intra language or a link language or a lingua franca. And also uh, among other nations in Asia and the rest of the world. So we are not much concerned about the British kind of or American kind of pronunciation. Uh, we have our own pronunciation, but you are not totally deviating from the uh, British and American English because we need to communicate with them. But there are specific differences that we, we are not now any further. We are not ashamed or afraid of using our variety of the English language because now it has developed to some that extent. Now, similarly, uh, Chinese English, uh, Singaporean English, African English, all kind of geographical varieties are there. So, English language in post-colonial Asia. So now, uh, yeah, this is what I talked about. Right. 
Now, there is a gentleman called Raj B. Kashru. Uh, he has developed a model of English, world Englishes, world Englishes, not the British and American, only world Englishes. Now, he has identified three circles, inner circle languages, 380 million uh, people using them. That is called norm providing, norm, they enable law. They provide the norm, the grammar, the rules, the vocabulary, and all these things they provide. They are native speakers as the first language uh, speakers. Um, countries like UK, USA, Australia, New Zealand, Anglophone Canada, South Africa, some Caribbean territories. Now they are the first language. They speak English as the first language, and they are the norm providers as per Kachru's division, right? Inner circle. Uh, then outer circle, norm developing. So these outer circle countries, the language norms are developing. So former colonies like uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, African countries. So we use it as a second language, as a lingua franca, as a link language. Uh, and we are norm developing. We are developing our own systems differently from the native speaker language. And then the expanding circle, that is norm dependent, they depend on the norms provided by inner circle countries. These are countries like um, China, Japan, Russia, Nepal, South Korea, Egypt. So these are countries which were not ruled by the British, right? They were not colonies, no historical or governmental role. Uh, so the system of education, judiciary, etc., have not been influenced. Education have not been changed. Their own language is used for that, and but they learn it mainly for international communication. So, um, uh, so it is the uh, their first language is totally different. So uh, that is the expanding circle. So uh, this is the same thing in the uh, diagram that Kashru has developed. Uh, inner circle, the outer circle, and the expanding circle. Uh, but now see more than the, this inner circle people, 380 million, uh, then outer circle 150 to 300 million people. Now billions of other speakers in the expanding circle, there are more uh, people speaking English now than the native speakers. Yeah, so this is the same thing in a different way, Kachra has put. Now see, the expanding circle as China, Egypt, Indonesia, Israel, Japan, Korea, Nepal, Saudi Arabia, Taiwan, Russia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Caribbean islands, etc. They have to make a, a special effort to learn the language because the language does not exist there in, in administration, schooling, and all these systems. They don't have it. But uh, the outer circle countries like ours, we have it as a second language. We have our mother tongue, single and Tamil, and in addition to that, we have the English language as a second language. So we have be we have better knowledge people in English in our circles than the inner circle USA, etc. Okay. Uh, so I would like to take you to another aspect of development: world Englishes and new literatures. What is literature? Literature review can you in a me? Sahitya. New literatures. Now, why new literature? English literature, uh, like Shakespeare, Wordsworth, etc. They have written a lot of books and uh, poems and uh, short stories and all that. That is called literature. New literatures is a new variety of English literature that has come from the post-colonial countries, like ours, post-colonial literatures or new literatures. So the literature in, uh, in English by people from formerly colonized countries is called new literatures or post-colonial literature. People are from our countries writing in English, right? That is called new literatures. Now, this has an importance, right? Now, these writers address the problems and consequences of the decolonization of a country. Now, after colonization, there was decolonization and still the colonized mentality is there. So in a way, these writers help to decolonize the country. Sahitya Haraha, through literature, they were trying to rectify the mentality of our people, especially they were talking about questions relating to the political and cultural independence of formerly subjugated people and deals with themes such as racialism, colonialism, and all that, right? And then developed another thing, 
literary theories. Now there are what I call literary theories, Sahitya, which are Karna Krama theories to evolve around the subject addressing the role of literature in perpetuating and challenging cultural imperialism. Now, what is called cultural imperialism? Then but culturally they are maintaining their imperialism. That is called cultural imperialism. So through literature, they were uh, trying, some were trying to perpetuate or to continue that imperialism, and some were challenging that cultural imperialism. Uh, as mentioned by the post-colonial critic Edward Said in his book, Orientalism. This is a very, very important book for all Sri Lankans to read, educated Sri Lankans. So make a note of it whenever you have a time, even after your exams, even after years after that. If you fi find uh, this thing, it is very, very important to have our own national mentality. Edward Said, the book's name of the book is Orientalism. He's a post-colonial critic. Critic means uh, uh, so it's a very seminal source. Please make a note of it. If you, if, and when you get a chance, you can read. So in Orientalism was written in 1978 by Edward Sedneme, Edward Said. Uh, critics, it critics the Eurocentric cultural imperialism, Eurocentricism. European Kendra uh, Vidhya Salakagana Pavatina cultural imperialism. He was critiquing that, he was questioning that very seriously. And he describes and critiques the West's portrayal of the East. Now, East is portrayed, Egala Pinture Penani, Ape Pinture, how the Penani, but here. So they describe, uh, so he describes and critiques questions this way, Western. Portrayal. Through literature and language. So the Orient or Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East. So they are the people who tell us you are this. So Orientalist works. Now, for example, E.M. Forster's Passage to India, this is a novel in 1924. Make a note of this thing. Passage to India. And Leonard Wolf's Village in the Jungle. The Village in the Jungle. Bad Degam. Kiela Potak. Translate Kalla Tibba Maker. It was a Chitrapati Akhtibba. Bad Degam Kiela. Ala Balalaj Samharai. Ike Pradana Naluha Hiti Vijay Kumar Tunga. Leonard Wolf's The Village in the Jungle. Leonard Wolf was a government agent in Sri Lanka, British one. He wrote about the village in the jungle. Now, through these works, what they did was create the Orient. They created an Asia that they saw from their eyes. And we people read them and we thought, ah, oh, that is Asia. But that was the one that was critiqued and questioned by Edward Said. Now, is this true? You know, Prashnakare or Edward Said. So, then there was the development of the empire rights back. Uh, the time is 426. Uh, Dr. Hemanta. Hello. How much time is left? I, I, I did not keep track of the time. Uh, I think so. Uh, Dr. Hemanta's uh, laptop is a uh, laptop battery is a date. Ah, okay, so uh, because of the delay, I can I, I think we can take a little more time. But uh, yes, from sir. this slide, we will stop and then take a break and uh, we'll restart from after this slide, right? Uh, um, okay, sir. Oh, then the Empire Rights Back. This is another very important book. Uh, anybody who uh, is interested, we make a note of it. Empire Rights Back, 1989 by Bill Ascroft, Gareth Griffiths, and Helen Tiffin. These three writers wrote this one. This is a very, very important book to discover ourselves. Empire writing back means like we also have taken our guns into our hands against the Eurocentricism. So this is a 
radical critique of Eurocentric notions of language and literature. So language and literature, uh, their dominance through these two tools, language and literature, they were continuing this cultural imperialism, Eurocentricism, uh, Europe, knowledge. They were really radically questioning and critiquing. That in investigates how the post-colonial texts, post-colonial texts constitute a radical critique of the Eurocentric notions of literature and language. So with this, developed a set of writers, in, especially in Africa and India. Uh, examples are R.K. Narayan, Mukraj Anand, Raja Rao, African writers like Chinua Achebe, there are uh, there, is, there are three very nice books if you read uh, by Chinua Achebe, make a note of it and try and find. Things Fall Apart is the first novel. Uh, there were three novels written by him. Uh, Things Fall Apart, how that beautiful culture in that country was broken and shattered by the Western powers. And after that, the res as a result of that, how they were disoriented totally. Uh, 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 that story is told by uh, Chinua Achebe. And uh, all these Asian writers were challenging. They were writing back to the West, right? Okay, so the globalization and role of English language. Uh, and now, now we are moving on to globalization. Now we talked about uh, colonial enterprise and post-colonial enterprise. The next one is globalization. Everybody knows about globalization now and the role of the English language, right? Now, how do we define globalization? Now, globalization is the growth of growth to global or worldwide scale. Uh, globalization. So when we talk about economic globalization, it is not limited to one country. It is the whole world economy, cultural globalization. So one culture for whole, the whole globe and that kind of story and political globalization, one system politically, the whole country will a globalized one and it is not individual countries and that kind of concept came with globalization. Now the question is, is it the continuation of the economic, cultural, and political hegemony of the West? And this is a serious question that we must ask. Now, through the idea of globalization, is it another way of continuing the hegemony of the West, cultural hegemony, the political hegemony, the economic hegemony by the West, right? Because the language that is used and uh, the systems that are run and all that are dominated by their systems and their language. So globalization speeded up with the advancements of ICT and modern technologies in the 21st century. Now, uh, today, uh, to that extent that we can communicate with anyone in the world, anywhere in just a matter of few seconds uh, through this kind of technology and you can see them and all that. So we are a globalized world. Now. English language plays a significant role in globalization as well. How it is used as a tool for communication, not as a clear symbol of power or status to dominate. Now it is not a status mark like uh, English speaking uh, superior and all that. Now that is used as a, as a tool of tool for communication. And even in Sri Lanka, English language is spoken by all classes, right? Uh, if you get an exposure to the language, you can communicate. Now, for technological advancements and knowledge sharing, you use it, uh, the English language. Uh, so English is the media that is used in the internet and all that. So discussion and uh, propagation of non-European values. Now, even for this now, the English language is used to propagate non-European values like Asian values. And, and as the common language for the whole world. Now, there are good things as well as bad things. Now the English language has become more kind of people friendly. Uh, it is not kind of their language fully, but it is our language as well to some extent. Yeah, you can see the, the, the usage of the uh, in, in the internet. Now English language is used 55.5.7. I have just borrowed it from the internet. Uh, and then uh, all the others 
uh, uh, the Chinese 3.3, etc., German 6%. So there are very, very minimal percentages. Uh, and number of users of the internet, now see uh, the British and English speaking is the highest, right? Uh, so there, this this is also dominated by the English language, right? Now another, I'm taking you to another aspect called Pan Asianism versus Eurocentricism. So, so far, we were talking about Eurocentricism. The center is the Europe, the Britain, America. Even America is a part of this, right? When you say Eurocentricism, America is also a part of it. Eurocentric, English centric kind of. Uh, so now Pan Asianism is something that developed against Eurocentricism in recent times, right? So there is what is called Pan-Asian ideology. Pan-Asian means only Asian, right? That kind of idea. So an Asian reaction, this is an Asian reaction of recent times to the Euro-American dominance in the globalized world. Now we talked about globalization in this globalized world. People in Asia, powerful countries in Asia like Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, now they were economically powerful and they began to see that they are economically powerful, but still Euro-American dominance is there in the globalized world. So they wanted to have their own say and they tried to sort of develop what is called pan-Asian ideology, mm -hmm. led by countries such as Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, etc. So this is an attempt to identify common Asian customs and values particularly through Confucian values, religious Confucian values. They wanted to identify common Asian customs and values and form a formidable uh, group as against the Eurocentric community. So a cultural and political ideology, this is a cultural and political ideology which defines elements of social norms, ethical values, traditional customs, belief systems, artifacts, arts and culture, and technologies common to the nations of the Southeast Asia and East Asia, both historically and presently. So they were concentrating more on Southeast Asia and East Asia countries like the uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, etc. Not India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. We are South Indian countries. We were not that important for them. We are not that uh, economically powerful. So they were trying to sort of develop another dichotomy that is a binary opposition, pan-Asianism versus Eurocentricism. So in fact, this is a development to suppress Eurocentricism, right? So pan-Asian ideology, uh, basic commonality of collectivism and communitarianism is used to unify people for their economic and social good and to react, uh, to create a pan-Asian identity. So collectivism, we are a collective set of people uh, in Asia, we are collectivism and communitarianism, community. Now you can see the political system also, like in China, et cetera, they are not a democratic system, uh, community-wise, uh, collectivism, in not individualism. In the West, Eurocentric idea, it challenges the Western ideas of individualism. Uh, individualism felt to be incompatible. So they found that these people who are propagating pan-Asianism felt that these systems, this democratic system and all these are incompatible, not matching with the Asian region. However, pan-Asian ideology is yet another binary opposition, a dichotomy against Euro-American ideology or the hegemony in the globalized world. Eka hegemony ka kwenwada tawe hegemony ka khada ganda ya na utsa haya pagi tamay meka penne as against the Eurocentrism. Okay, so now cultural disharmony versus cultural harmony. Now this is a question that I am asking. Read through this very carefully. Can we identify any common feature in the usage of language and literature throughout this historical progression and cultural and ideologically battles in the world in about five centuries of time span of our histories? Now, after colonization, now we 
face the colonization. We were decolonized and then through literature and all that we have developed differently. Now we have come to the globalized world and all that. So during these five centuries or so, can we identify any common feature in the usage of language and literature throughout this historical progression? Any common feature? The answer I will give, the next bullet point, the answer is the diverse cultural identities and diverse ideologies that support and foster division, separation, conflict, domination, suppression, oppression, and for all the negative things that our world has been experiencing, even the pan-Asianism, the solution that we are proposing from Asia. So there are diverse cultural identities and diverse ideologies they are fighting. These are all dichotomies, all binary oppositions. And the result is they support and foster Bedim, Venaswim, conflict, Arbud, Anika Paravayam, domination, Pida Kirim, suppression, oppression, and all the negative things in the world. Uh, through although there are changes, historically there are changes in the way they are appearing. Now, it is a continuation, read this carefully, it is a continuation of humanity through superiority and inferiority complexes. You understand superiority complex and inferiority complex? Mahamane, Uchamane, Sahinamane. Api ekpo, ekpo api Mahamane, api anittai roda superior ki lahetan api no, netang anittai roda api pahati ki lahetan complexes. We, we have those complexes. The West have the superiority complex, the East have the inferiority complex. Now, even the pan-Asian uh, uh, ideology is trying to sort of okay, show that we are superior and they are inferior. So other way around. So this developed through dichotomies or binary oppositions of cultural identities and ideologies, which are mentally constructed, unreal realities. All these cultural identities, all these ideologies are mentally constructed unreal realities. That is what I find. These are apimanasing hadagattu, unreal realities. They are not real realities, very unreal realities. So if we understand the true nature of these binary oppositions, that what is the true nature? That they are dynamic and continuously changing we the Asians and they the Europeans or Euro-Americans could genuinely respect different cultural identities and ideologies in complementary relationships, not against them, but in complementary relationships we can, if we genuinely identify that we can respect one another. The result would be comparison, sorry, compassion, respect, tolerance, understanding, loving kindness, all the good things as against the division, suppression, oppression, fighting, conflict, etc. So instead of black versus white ideology, West versus East ideology, uh, Eurocentric versus Asia-centric ideology, we can have black and white ideology. Eurocentric and uh, Asia centric ideology, Western and Eastern ideology. In, in complementary relationship, one completing the other, then there will be a better world for all of us to live in. So there will be less conflicts if we can achieve that. So is pan Asian ideology a solution or is it a temporary? alternative. Of course, it is a temporary alternative. Uh, please be uh, attentive. This is the last uh, two slides, right? So please listen to this carefully, because this is the climax of all what I have been trying to say. Uh, I have been showing you the progression and now coming to a kind of a conclusion. So pan-Asian ideology, is it a solution as against the Eurocentricism or is it a temporary alternative is the question I asked. 
I believe that it does not touch upon the deeper nuances of fundamental Asian values of fundamental Asian values, deeper nuances, meanings of fundamental Asian values. So this Pan-Asianism, I believe, if does not touch upon those fundamental nuances of Asian values. They were dealing with economic uh, things, the power, and uh, to have more dominance over the other side, right? So our fundamental Asian values of unconditional compassion. This is very important. Compassion, unconditional. It does not depend on any condition. It is not because he loves me, I love her. Not that. Unconditional compassion. Because he is poor, therefore I pity him. Not that. Uh, so he is rich, therefore I hate him. Not that. Unconditional. It does not depend on condition. Compassion, loving kindness, karma, uh, to all beings. Simplicity, equality, and equanimity, samanatmata, found in Asian philosophies like in the pristine Buddha Dhamma. Now, don't take it wrongly as this is about preaching of Buddhism. No, not that. Uh, this is just one example. But other uh, in Asian cultures, in India, uh, Pakistan, all these Asian cultures, we have the common, this thing, the simplicity, quality of equanimity, samanatmatave, found in a any Asian philosophy, like in pristine, I have taken this as an example because this is closer to us, Buddha Dhamma, which shows the negativity of dualistic thinking. Now, this philosophy shows the negativity of dualistic thinking, dichotomous thinking, binary opposition thinking, at the root of which exists raga, that is mental attachment with liking, mental attachment with liking, and those that is dvesha, mental attachment with dislike, and then moha, that is inability to comprehend this dualistic dichotomous existence. So this raga and those are dualism, they are they are together, and because of moha, that is ignorance, inability to see that, comprehend that these two things are together in existence, so these are the root causes of dualistic thinking, which constitute the root causes for all conflicts in human existence. Now, these are the root causes for all conflicts in human existence. So this could only be found in Asian, uh, true Asian values, fundamental Asian values. That next slide, last slide. Yeah, in conclusion, so I propose that we in Sri Lanka share with most Asian nations some of the above attributes, share with most Asian nations, I repeat, with all these Asian countries, there is a shared uh, simplicity and all that. Some of the above attributes, irrespective of differences in religions, there may be differences in religion, but it doesn't matter because at the base of our cultures lie these values that are distinctly identifiable from those of the West. So these are distinctly identifiable from the values of the West. Right. This, I believe, would pave us the path for an Asian ideology that does not compete with Western ideology. Remember, this is an ide Asian ideology that does not compete with Western ideology, no competition. Instead, it will serve as an alternative ideology, alternative, a venue that anyone, anywhere could share as a neutral ideology, whether it is in the West or East, anybody can share it. If you understand it, neutral ideology that propagates peace, and harmony among people and nations anywhere in the world. So this is a universal ideology that can be passed, passed on through the medium of the international language of English as the only language commonly shared by most countries in the world. Now see the importance of the English language. Why I have used this language for this one is because that is the only language, thanks to the Western uh, people, 
that is very uh, prominently used all over the world. So, which I believe is the new role of the English language in the 21st century. And we, the Asians, are grateful to the West for providing us the common link that is the English language. That concludes my presentation and thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, is to learn, uh, uh, any questions? Have, if you have any questions, questions can, can you ask? ask? I welcome some questions, although the time is uh, 449, uh, because uh, this questioning mind is the most important thing, not just listening to somebody talking. And you can just be satisfied, okay, I just listened to some of you may have heard, listened, and some may not have listened. Some of you are just there, maybe online, uh, but that does not matter. But uh, if you have any queries, I welcome. It's very nice to hear any questions. Sir? Yeah. Sir, yeah, please. Uh, so, so this is a uh, question I had in terms of that neutral ideology um, yeah. concept. So, sir, yeah. you mentioned uh, characteristics such as loving kindness, equality, in, and equanimity should mm. be propagated uh, as a neutral ideology. Uh, mm. But sir, is it something that can be realistically done because the um, Asian countries also value materialism, which is something mm. we got in the West. Mm. And as long as that value for materialism exists, mm. is it possible to uh, foster these qualities? Okay, uh, very good question, uh, Ms. Kulatilaka. Uh, and the uh, only thing is that, yes, in the present uh, mode, uh, where in this present, uh, how things are happening, we may feel that it is really unrealistic. But remember, the world is always dynamic. Now, the, the, the expansion of 500 years time that I showed you showed how the world became sort of the, the, the understanding of the people, how people uh, received the world, perceived the world, how that changed over the years, 500 years time, right? And um, it is just a matter of time, right? Now, um, think of the time of the Buddha. Now, how did he change? Now, that was 2,500 years ago. Now, he came out and changed the whole world view. So, that is a total paradigm shift, right? Now, uh, this is a cyclical thing, you know. So, there is no, uh, I mean, climax kind of you everything changes over time uh, so in this materialistic world there would be one day that people will realize okay materialism is not the solution for our problems right so this may sound a little you know so we are in a hurry to find the kind of find solutions for problems but uh, oh, how much you are, how much we are in a hurry we will not you know sort of resolve problems but at least to have an idea about okay there was a time when these principles were propagated and these principles were really in in power and they were like dominating and they were like uh, uh, people believed in those things and people followed that that kind of a time so this is a cyclical thing. Uh, so materialistic uh, world will change, uh, will change towards uh, spiritualistic world also. So this is not, uh, I mean, a utopian kind of thinking, right? So, but first thing is people must be aware that there is such a possibility, right? So it is just with one drop of water, you will start collecting a glass of water, right? And uh, so overnight you can't do things, but it is the realization of people of what kind of a useless thing that we are doing. Uh, individually, people should, uh, if, if they realize 
they will seek solutions individually. So when such individuals are more in a society, their influence will be felt on the community. And when there are several communities, you know, that will go into countries and the world as well. So there is this possibility there. So that can be sort of negated 100%. So I'm just showing that there is another path, right? Just following uh, this materialistic uh, greed, you know, we are looking for power, dominance, greed. We want to achieve things, right? Even education for that matter. We want to compete and get better education to compete with others and get a better job. Nothing wrong in this, right? So this is what we are doing. But we must know that these are unrealistic realities. With that awareness, we should go forward. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? It sounds a kind of a utopian kind of a thinking, but uh, if everybody thinks like that, where are we going to end up? Anybody else, please? Any other questions? Uh, so yeah. Uh, yes. Sir, uh, you mentioned about the cultural disharmony um, and cultural harmony. So uh, yeah. my question is, how has the way people use language and uh, like uh, use literature either made our world more divided and conflicted or helped uh, to bring people together and uh, reduce problems over the past decades? Uh, yeah, right. Now, now, see, um, now literature of course has been uh, helping us to change the way of way of way people have been thinking like so i just took two examples where uh, these two books uh, it is um, uh, leonard wolf's bad Degama village in the jungle uh, and that was to propagate their way of thinking right their way of looking at their way of looking at asia and the sri lanka and the people in sri lanka because from their angle and then uh, they are developed a counter argument from uh, of course in sri lanka there is less uh, literature found but uh, other writers developed you know the counter arguing so there will be two sides of the story for the people to look so literature is also you can't take it you know out of the whole context and you can't expect people to write okay uh, i'm writing to you know sort of purify this, uh, these people and to make them understand all that. But they should reflect the realities at the city so that people are made to think, right? So to make a thinking nation. So uh, the, the tragedy is like uh, the people have no time to read literature, uh, uh, Ms. Gale will again. Uh, people don't find time for reading literature because we are in competition, right? Now, what, what is your faculty? What is your degree program? Hello. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. What uh, is your degree program? Sir, yes, sir. Logistics management, sir. Okay, logistics management. So now see in your degree, now you are concentrating about the how to manage logistics and all that and all that to get a first class degree and all that very competitive, right? And to get a good job and all that. And so you read those stuff and find hardly any time to enjoy piece of literature and to think deeply so this th this uh, these subjects of you know which improve your thinking analytical thinking creative thinking how you perceive the world all these things have become less and less in this competitive world so uh, equally the writers of that quality are sort of going down so it once again it is a cyclical thing there will be a time once again this technology oriented uh, sort of materialistic requirements will be felt less and people will tend to think reflectively about whether we are doing the right thing the correct thing is this is this the life and how are we going to end up now uh, uh, you do jobs and you know earn a lot of money build houses buy cars and then you get old and your children are not there to look after you and you are isolated in a, a, this thing uh, and all that so whether we are are we sort of achieving as what we need as human beings so people will in the long run 
think of Christian in this thing. So literature can, can do, of course, a lot. But once again, it should be, not be a purposeful kind of, you know, agenda or a, or a project like the Western cultural this project. So it should emerge from the people, from within their psyches, from within their uh, spiritual uh, themselves, right? I, I, I hope I have given some kind of an answer for the question. Okay. Yes, you did, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, sir, I have another question. Yeah. Sir, uh, sir, you talked about how the English language was used as a tool for the imperialist project. Hmm. Um, sir, do you think the effects of colonization have made the people of this country um, lo lose the fluency in the Sinhala language, even though we are not connected to the English language that much? Because uh, a common feature I see that we don't, speak Sinhala continuously. We tend to borrow words from the English yeah. language. Yeah, yeah. So that is, of course, not colonization, but this is a part of uh, globalization, right? Now, oh. this in this globalized world, now we get a lot of, uh, you know, English inputs most of the time. Uh, so we, we educate ourselves in English and we go to the internet in English, we use mobile phones and that they are again English. Uh, so we are in a kind of a world where we don't have one particular language to be used. So uh, that we can't grumble about, like languages, you know, they are dynamic and continuously change. Like some Puritans can say that, okay, because of this English education, Sinhala will be no more and uh, uh, we have to protect Sinhala language and all that and all that. But there's no purpose in fighting uh, to rescue the language because this is a historical process where languages develop, they change. And uh, if you just listen to old English, yeah, Shakespeare in English, uh, even before Shakespeare in English, there's what is called old English you will not understand anything of it because that is so different from the modern English language. It has developed, it has changed. The borrowing, you don't have to worry because now this English language is borrowed from French, Scandinavian languages, German, even Sinhala, Tamil, Hinduism, uh, sorry, Hindustani, and all languages they have borrowed. And these uh, French words are dominant in the English language. English, original English words are very, very limited. But uh, the, the borrowed words are the uh, majority of words in the English language. So, uh, so the words that are borrowed from English for singular, they become, you know, sort of sing singlish first, and then they'll be automatically turning into singular terms. So this way it will continue. We don't have to worry. But uh, when it comes to writing, yes, I understand that there is a, this thing. Uh, people tend to go for English education and less uh, this thing for single education. So these are all a part of the continued game, right? That is true. What you say is true. It can affect, it affects, it has affected. And also grammar. Grammar also changes, keeps on changing. You can't sort of establish it and say, okay, this is the grammar and you have to continue this for the next 100 to 200 years or so. It will not happen because it is the people's thing. People change it. In our generation, we change it. We add it, add new words, we add new grammar and we die down. We don't know what happens in the next 100 years. Now, even the single language, if you look back uh, thousands of years ago, sorry, maybe if you go back to another thousand years, the writing is totally different. We can't even read and understand, but it is still the single language, right? So we are in a historical point in time. Where we are using that language that is there right now, but in the future it will change. It will not be this language. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, so uh, yeah. we, uh, we are running out of the time. Uh, okay. Uh, so, guys, right, okay, uh, uh, if you have uh, any other questions, please uh, direct uh, our email address, uh, urakedu at gmail.com. Uh, so, I invite the student to deliver the speech uh, uh, word of thanks. Right. Over to you. 
Uh, before that, uh, before that, let me uh, thank uh, Dr. Himantha, uh, who is responsible for all this uh, this program, and he is the one who initiated this whole program and continued and getting this uh, uh, getting this um, uh, course to Sri Lanka for the fourth, I think, fourth time consecutively. So. Uh, I thank him and uh, the social science department and uh, even the two of you who are coordinating, uh, Satu Mohati and uh, Ms. Kulatilaka and all the other students who participated. Thank you. Hope that you have got something out of this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, over to you, dear sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to it's my pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the students of the short course on cultural linkage towards an Asian ideology. First, I would like to thank our lecturer, Mr. Kitsri Amartunga, for sharing his time and knowledge with us and for delivering today's lecture amidst his busy schedule. Sir, we are blessed to have you contribute to this course. Next, I wish to thank Dr. Hemant Premaratna and other staff of KDU who have brought these lectures together. Thank you. Last but not least, I thank all participants from our university for joining us today. Your participation has made this lecture a successful event and, and I believe it has provided you with an insight into the, the English language and cultural engaged towards an Asian ideology and beyond. To conclude, let me once more express my gratitude to Mr. Kitsri Amartunga for accepting our invitation for the fourth consecutive year and delivering today's lecture. Sir, it is an honor to have you with us and your time and effort are deeply appreciated. Thank you very much.